Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm here talking with Jonah. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Uh, really great to be here today. So for those that don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself, what you do, and where you're located? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is uh, Jonah Anderson. I work as a software engineer and uh, IT consultant at a cons uh, Forefront Consulting, a consulting company here in uh, Sweden. So that's what I do as my uh, daytime job. And I code, I'm a .NET developer and I love coding uh, with Microsoft Azure. So yeah. <laughs> Remind me, your MVP, is it developer technologies? Uh, no, it's, uh, oh. it's uh, Microsoft Azure. Oh, uh, Azure, okay. Yes. Yeah, Excellent. yes. Yeah, it's it's funny as a Microsoft partner, it's like I talk Azure numbers every day, not the details of the technical aspects of it, but as a partner, I mean, it's a huge part of my day, uh, co-sell activities and talking about Azure consumption with customers in our own organization. And and so it's just become part of the, the daily grind, always talking about Azure. <laughs> yes, but I actually aim also to have uh, developer technologies because I also love like programming, like maybe create content for C Sharp or .NET, which is also really good and helpful for other developers. So I'm not sure. I, I think it's possible to have two categories. It is. There are some that even have three, and I, I, I can't fathom the amount of content and activities that you have to have to be able to, to hold down three. But yeah, actually, yeah, it's interesting that there are more and more that have MVPs that have two. And for those that aren't aware, I mean, to become an MVP, I mean, obviously there's a, there is, it's a black box of a process. Like there's no one way like, hey, I've done all these things, therefore give me an MVP uh, uh, award. It's up to Microsoft's discretion, but typically it's a lot of blogging, a lot of speaking at online and in-person events. It's a lot of involvement with your local community, kind of all those things. And I'll let you kind of get into your experience. So think of that as, you know, kind of doubling that volume, speaking a lot on multiple topics to be able to earn those that that dual MVP but it's it's pretty impressive feat for people that are able to do that yes uh it's not my uh, ambition right now maybe in the f near future but right now I'm satisfied to have the MVP award for Microsoft Azure so as you said as well uh I didn't know. Actually, I started uh, sharing uh, and public speaking and blogging about Microsoft Azure. It's just about like for the past year. That's why I got the MVP award. And to be honest, I didn't know that MV Microsoft MVP award existed until, until someone who interviewed me on the podcast had a friend that worked in Microsoft said that Jonah, you're you're already doing MVP stuff. You should be an MVP. And uh, like like someone in Microsoft just nominated me. I submitted all the contributions that I've been doing for the past years. And, uh, you know, it takes a process, it takes time. Right. And there's it an takes, interview. There's right. Yeah, yeah. that's yep. right. And then they, you have it's not just about contribution. I know that you've been an MVP for many, many years. I, I've seen your MVP profile and you have a lot of great content. And I found out after I talked to, I had an interview that being an MVP is not about sharing content. It's also your passion to help the community. And that's what I, what I love and what I'm passionate about. So it's just well, like, a, it's it, the MVP award is uh, like a token of what I've been doing. So I'm really happy. Yeah, it, well, it's, and I, I've said this, again and again it's that and i think when you and i were talking last time um we kind of said the same thing is that you know we would do the same things whether or not we had the mvp like i really enjoy this process of going and learning about things and then sharing what i've learned about that i love 
uh, it, doing like this interview series. I love hearing what other people are doing, novel approaches to the same technology. So even I'm, my MVP is in Office Apps and Services. So I started as the SharePoint MVP in Office 365 and now Teams. I do most of the content around Teams and all of that. It's all around collaboration technology, which is such a broad topic. I mean, even when you talk Azure, such a broad topic yeah. uh, you know, of, of focus areas within Azure and what you do. Um, and so it, it's it's not surprising. I'm sure we'll see like it, that'll get divided two years from now. There <laughs> might be, you know, five new, very specific focus areas within Azure, for example. I yeah, just I randomly pick that number. I don't have any inside view. <laughs> Some people <laughs> will ask me, but it's like, what five areas? areas do you have you heard are going to be split you know azure split into like no i randomly picked that number i just as an example <laughs> yeah uh, i agree with you uh it's uh microsoft azure is a very broad like technology like as a developer working with azure it's also like a lot of things to learn to choose from that's why uh, when it comes to cert certifications, because they also recently uh, cleared the Azure Developer Associate certifications and the fundamentals, it, it is important to choose what kind of role-based certifications that you want to have that will help you in your day job. So, yeah. Well, that's and that's part of what's fun too. I mean, there's a there's a lot of opportunity for for anybody for for somebody who's saying, "Hey, I'd love to find out more and become an uh, you know, an MVP." Uh, I've had a number of people that said, "Well, it's my goal to become an MVP." I was like, "Well, that's great to have the goal," um, but these were people that, in fact, one person in particular I'm thinking of, who said that two three years um, he was trying to become an MVP. And where he actually came at the end, the end of that process and said, you know, uh, he, he was uh, very active in leading this user group, was part of the board there, was became the president of the user group, um, was consulting on it, was speaking at, at you know, uh, events every month, um, writing a lot and doing all that. And he said, you know, I just realized that I, I don't care if I ever get the MVP. I mean, I, I, it's been so rewarding. Uh, the, the connections that I've made, it's helped my career and do kind of all those things. And uh, like, I, I'm not kidding, a month later, he got his MVP. So he was yeah. surprised by, it. he didn't realize he was still, he had been, had the interview and all of that, but still there was the selection process. It doesn't mean that, hey, you've been interviewed, you've provided the, the last year of all the activities. There still has to be an opening that has to be, you know, the, the timing of it could could change. And, and uh, so it was great to see that happen, but it, it I think that's that's kind of the point. What he realized is that the benefits of doing uh, of being part of the community, um, it, that's what it's really all about. And yes, uh, I agree. whether whether you become an MVP or not, you know, it's it's just a piece of paper. And yeah, it's great to have the access and this other community thing and to have this, the recognition around it. Um, but the 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 greater benefit comes from just participating in the community. Yeah, I agree with you. It's not just like uh, collaborating and sharing knowledge and feeling empowered by the entire community, but it's also you yourself, like as you speak, as you share, as you blog, you learn as you share about Azure, or as, as you share about your knowledge to others. So it's like a, a two way and it's really, uh, really great. And before I got the award, I uh, some a few people already told me that you're already an MVP for us, Jonah. So when I was waiting for the process, like for the decision, I was thinking I'm gonna continue what I've been I've been doing because I love what I do, just like your friend. So yeah. <laughs> well, so what's the what, so what is the kind of the, the the latest things that are going on in Azure? Like, what are you passionate about right now? What are what are kind of the topics that you're speaking on and writing on? Yeah, uh, lately, especially for the past months, I've been uh, speaking a lot about serverless, uh, developing uh, serverless with uh, Azure Functions, specifically with uh, durable functions where you as a developer focus on creating some, uh, creating uh, event-driven solutions and functions as a service uh, through uh, Microsoft Azure using your favorite uh, programming language. Uh, and for my case, it's uh, C-sharp and .NET because that's where what I do as a daily job. 
So I've actually in April this year, I spoken seven public talks <laughs> online. And uh, I think half of them were all about Azure Functions. And lately I've been also developing Azure Functions or durable functions in different patterns because there are pa different patterns that that technology can solve. Like you can perform uh, like stateful functions and run it parallel and you get the result. So I'm trying to work uh, a project where I can develop it with integrations with different APIs like SendGrids, Twitter, and uh, like a Cosmos DB. And lately I've been posting a lot about it and some of my contacts, new contacts on LinkedIn, they're interested to get to have a content about how to protect your serverless functions with Azure Key Vault. So that I haven't tried that. So I'm I'm learning that so I can share. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. So what what kind of uh, what kind of customer solutions are you developing with these? Yeah, uh, it's actually uh, you mean for Azure Functions? Yes. Yes, yep. it's uh, for uh, it's for uh, it's a function as a service. So it's actually like specific to the backend part of your application. So if you want to connect, it's mostly used, it's not suitable for for all type of business requirements. It actually depends on your backend service talking to APIs. And uh, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't want to get too technical on this talk, <laughs> but uh, I can I can share some links. <laughs> well, I know it's just it's interesting. You have you know, people that that aren't working with Azure and and to understand some of the yeah. you know the 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 business um, you know uh, requirements that drive some of this kind of development. So yeah, you know, what like what are the what are some of the you know what are customers actually asking for? Like the customer doesn't line uh -huh. up and just say, well, would you like you to go and develop a solution using Azure Functions? You know, but it's a uh, to to. Yeah. Maybe expand on that, the types of customer solutions that you uh, work on that you're that you're building this using this technology for. I think it's uh, more useful when you want to create a backend service that connects to the APIs. But uh, as for the business part, it's actually like depends on like for example, in if for example if you if you want to create a function as a service within Azure but you want your developer team not to not to think too much about infrastructure because uh, Azure is uh, taking care of that. And then one of the advantages of serverless in the business scenario is that you can, you can uh, pay as you go and uh, it creates productivity for your development team. And you can scale out and auto to scale. And the the advantage of that is actually uh, you can create long running processes in your application. So it it is something that you integrate with existing with existing applications or new applications. And it's like Azure Functions empowers it. It depends on what you need. It's <laughs> I hope I explained it properly, <laughs> like uh, in a way that you understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's all right. Uh, I I know that. Um, so some of the other uh, the events you've been participating in and do you have anything else going on this year are you doing any in person do you have anything on the uh, calendar for the year like what's what's the outlook in in your part of the world yeah i've uh for the past year i've been doing it uh, virtually but i have some like uh i sa submitted some proposals for in-person talks but i'm not sure how it will be considering the pandemic that we have right now but i really miss uh traveling so yeah. meeting the community <laughs> well that's that's the the hardest part about that uh, even with like i have my first uh back face the in-person event it's a hybrid event that will be in august and i think things are fairly opening up here so in the u.s so i think it's uh there's not a question like it, it'll happen it'll still it's yet to be seen here's an event that typically brought in four or five hundred people uh, in this annual event last year there was about a hundred that were in person and so whether we get back up to the four to five hundred number or not 
is a question. And then there's a, a, a one that I'm sure will be bigger. Um, it will be in Las Vegas in December. But those are the two main ones that I'm I'm looking to go do. So I'm 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 sure you're the same way. I'm very anxious to get back and yeah see actual live human beings. <laughs> yeah. Have you? I have a question. We we're talking about public speaking in person. Have you yeah. been? Have you been in Europe to do some public speaking, or do you do? do it uh, from time to time because I would love to like meet you in person and listen to yeah. your talks. Uh, so I usually, uh, I mean, for the last 10 years, I'm probably in over in Europe five or six times a year uh, it, for different events. So yeah, my last time there was the, the European SharePoint conference was in Prague in December of 2019. And I did one more trip before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, so I was on the road in January, and then I did an event in February of 2020. So, um, yeah, I hope to get back over there. Then, obviously, I, I mean, the other thing we're waiting for is a new MVP. One of the, it is a huge perk, is the uh, the MVP Summit on yes. campus uh, over in Redmond. It's a fantastic experience. And if nothing more, for, for those that are that haven't been an MVP and are, are interested, I mean, one great thing about it is, you know, we we all kind of congregate on campus there. It'll be interesting to see if they do another hybrid or if they do, a, you know, it's been online the last two times, but uh, um, whether they do a hybrid event and include people that are, you know, remote uh, as well as the in-person activities. Um, I suspect that's going to be the direction that Microsoft goes, that they can include more people who can't, still can't travel, but have the in-person activities. But it's, it's almost like... Um, being at university uh, so that you, you, while you're you're are surrounded by the people that are part of your area your focus area so for me you know sharepoint onedrive teams yammer kind of all the products that, that are the collaboration related things but you have the opportunity like i did um this the last time we were in person to go sit in an azure session to go uh, and, and to to yeah. go and sample these other these other sessions meet other mvps in other areas and interact with the Microsoft product teams. It's just, it's fantastic. Um, so highly recommend that. It, it, yeah, you know, I would love like that. that. Hopefully my first uh, summit will be in person because I'd like to meet uh, many great people that I follow already. Like even before I am, uh, became an MVP, I like learning from experts. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to um, meet all of them and you meeting you uh, as well. And I have a question for you. It's like I'm yeah. inter interviewing you as well. Yes. I know you've, been, you've been an MVP for many, many years. Like, uh, so you've been to summits many times. Did you gain a lot of close uh, MVP friends uh, for the past years being an MVP? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's yeah. it, it's a. Great. I mean, it's it's a great networking vehicle. Again, it, it's uh, depending on your your area of focus, and even I mean, you'll probably get to know the other Azure MVPs, but you know, you'll start to meet people. And this is one of those things where I highly encourage you, you do anything like that is that when you go in and you sit down in the room to kind of take the first few minutes and you know, like introduce yourself to the people sitting around you. And so I've been, you know, this will be my, with this renewal cycle, it'll be 10 years that I've been an MVP. And of course I had plenty of friends that were MVPs prior to that. And I was at Microsoft prior to that and knew some MVPs while I was a Microsoft employee as well. Um, so uh, it, it, so I see the familiar faces, but, uh, and there's also the thing where, and I'm sure you'll experience this plenty too, is that where I know people's faces from their Twitter profile picture or their, you know, I know them from <laughs> online activities, but then I remember, I was like, I've never actually met you in, you know, in the physical form. So it's great <laughs> to have those those interactions um but yeah I, I you can't walk away from an event like that without just a handful of of new business cards and and contacts and uh, i mean i there are people that i'm i've remained friends with that i met like that first year so yeah it's yes. it's a great it's a great experience it it is a great experience and rewarding to meet great people. And that's one of the most rewarding uh, uh, things of being an MVP. You get the connections that you meet, the stories that you hear from different people and you well, learn that, from them. 
Exactly. Well, well, typically people who become MVPs, we are super connectors. We are people that love to network. And, and if I don't know the answer to the question. Like I know several people that probably know the answer and I'm happy to put somebody in touch with those people. Having said that, there are those people that will attempt to abuse that that process. But, you know, so <laughs> uh, so people who have a legitimate, hey, I, I'm looking for help in a certain area or I have these questions, it's like, please if, reach out. If you, there's somebody that has a Microsoft MVP as part of their title, like, don't be shy. Reach out and connect with us. Uh, and, and again, I, I'm happy happy to point people towards the people within my network who might be able to solve that problem, answer that question. Um, but it's, it, uh, you know, it, it, it's like at the end of a presentation, you know how this is. We yeah. say, if there are any questions and then it's silence in the room <laughs> and we like to joke and say, it's because I, my presentation was so uh, succinct and I've answered all <laughs> questions. Like, no, it's, you know, don't don't feel bad about that. You know, some people are shy, um, but feel free to. Here's how you email me. Find me on social media, but reach out afterwards. And uh, always happy to to make new connections that way. Yes, uh, I agree. That's uh, really great that we can uh, connect with others. And I, I would like related to that. I would like to share that uh, when I was a girl or a young kid, I was actually very shy. We're talking of shyness. So I used to hide behind my mom, my mom, when when it comes to like public speaking in schools and presentation. But for some strange reasons, when I I turned, I started working and you know became adult. I learned to like uh, I learned I learned to get out from my closet and share what I have to say. And I don't have experience with public speaking like professionally, like went to school for that. But I usually speak from the heart. And what I know, mm -hmm. so that's why that's when you you feel confident when you speak from your heart. Because sometimes when you read by like if you memorize too much, that's when you forget. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so. you you have some 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 of my favorite presenters, fellow MVPs, who talk about still like they're just so dynamic and they're fantastic on stage, and talk about every time the nervous butterflies that they, it makes them feel sick to get up in front of people and in front of the crowd. And I, I don't feel that way. So I, I'm a, uh, I'm a strange breed, but um, yeah, for, <laughs> for, for, for me, um, so many years ago, over 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, um, I was uh, in a band. I, I was a singer for a band. Okay. So I think being on stage and we played, every weekend for a couple of years. I mean, we were sometimes twice, you know, Friday and Saturday nights. And I think being up in front and singing, you know, songs that you wrote and lyrics that you wrote, that just kind of uh, burned off the uh, stage fright for me. And so getting up and talking about technology, again, about things that you're passionate about, things you're yeah. excited to go and share. And I, I, I tell stories when I, when I present. And so I, I'm not nervous when I'm sharing what I am passionate about, what I'm, you know, had personal experience about. Yeah, so. I agree. Because that's how you connect with uh, with your audience, with the people that are listening to you be it, through by by being genuine and sharing a story that c they can learn from also. Like it can be like yep. it doesn't have to be a perfect talk about a specific topic it's just like as long as you share your knowledge maybe a, a mistakes learned from a bad experience or for example i had a tech talk where uh in i think in december one of the talks that i had was i shared my uh lessons learned from a migration that i i did from an old dot net migration to azure so mm -hmm. I had that experience and I shared um, my lessons learned and what what I what I should have done in that situation that I shared to others. So it was like a talk that was uh, popular and it was good to talk it because it's like from the real experience. Yep. You know, yeah. it, it's funny. I just made me think, too, that I so I gave a presentation a couple of years back. I was down in, in Melbourne, Australia, and. Um, just as I was getting started, I had like went through like my title slide, a uh, slide that had my contact information and picture on it, 
and then like the table, like the contents of what I was going to cover in the session. And then the, the screen went blank. My laptop went blank. What happened was the video card in my laptop failed. Oy. So we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't get it back. So it was like, it was like done, like dead in the water, the beginning of my session. And so we spent about five to seven minutes fidgeting, trying trying to figure out what's going on. And finally, I just said, you know, hey, this is a it's a 60 minute session. We're 10 minutes into it already. I said, so I just while technical team was poking at it, I just started going through. I knew the material enough. And so I gave I gave that entire presentation for an hour on memory, but tell it like this. I knew the stories that I wanted to tell about it and the experiences and the major points around that. And I had, and I'm sure there were a bunch of people that were angry, at, you know, that they, we didn't get this. I'm like, you'll get the slides. I'll make them available once I'm able to retrieve this. But I had a bunch of people you know, come up afterwards. It's like, that was fantastic. Like I got so much out of that. And that, yeah. again, it speaks to, we sometimes... You know, you can close your eyes to whatever's showing on the screen and get the points from the from the speaker, from the presentation. And, and if you can, not that I ever want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but you did conquer but, the challenge. You deserve the standing ovation and that. After, well, after for, that. For, for people to, to get the value out of that, of what I had yeah. intended to do, even with the visuals up in place. I mean, that was very rewarding for me. So that wasn't anything. I don't look at that as, the, hey, my my skills as a speaker. Like, I limped through that. But uh, but it does speak to your passion comes through, um, knowing your material and the points that you want to communicate. And then I answered a lot of questions as I was talking and people were asking questions. It was more of a conversation, which I think personally – the best presentations are more of a conversation than they are, yeah. hey, let me just dictate this information. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So, I agree and with I, you. <laughs> and I never want to do that again. <laughs> uh, yes, but but if ever it happens again, you know, we cannot control technical problems. Then if ever it happens again, you have the experience to conquer it again. Yeah, yeah well... <laughs> And hopefully it's not. So that's always the danger. <laughs> if you have a presentation that is heavily demo centric, like what do you yeah. do then? Uh, uh, I understand. Yeah. I one of my recent talks, I I usually do presentation first and then do demos and show my code uh, project. And uh, when I was presenting, my code didn't work when I did live demo, and it was like inside of me if felt kind of embarrassing that I had to say sorry to the audience. And then the organizer or the host said, you don't have to say sorry for technical problems, Jonah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's well, one of the things I learned. <laughs> people have become more understanding too. But think because, think about it, like everybody is doing the web meetings. And so everybody, with the volume that we're doing, Everybody yeah. has been through the technical issues now. Uh, so I think there's a lot more empathy out there for yes. for that. And so that's, again, if you're making it more of a conversation, if it's more of, here's what we did. I mean, I actually, I, I love when that happens. Not, I know it's painful for the person <laughs> presenting, but when that kind of stuff happens, we are like, hey, they're, they're human after all. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. We've, we've worked them up in our minds to be these superheroes that they, they, they know they can answer any question. But I also that's why I also appreciate when people say it's like, you know, that's a great question. I have no idea what the answer is, but let me let yeah. me go figure this out. Let's take that offline or or let's let, let's go see who we can ask to get the answer to that. Um, so don't don't attempt to answer. Just guess something. But yes, to be honest about. Yeah. Not knowing something. That's okay. Yeah. That is well, with really, that, really great advice. Yeah. Well, there's so much that I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can honestly say there's so many things I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think easy. we all have, we have, every day is a learning opportunity for all of us. Like we think we, we know everything, but there's a lot of new things to learn from, from the technologies that we have and from others, the new people that we meet. Exactly. Well, Jonah, really appreciate your time uh, talking today. It's great to connect with you and get to know you. And for people that want to find out more about you, what are the best ways for them to reach you to find you? 
Yeah, uh, to connect with me, they can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, my name is uh, Jonah Anderson there, and I'm also on Twitter, CJ Kodare. And uh, I also have a website, uh, jonahanderson.tech, uh, so you'll find everything there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Christian, for having me here, and really great talking with you. You too. And of course, the links and everything will be over on uh, my blog at buckleplanet.com, as well as you know, in the description here for the YouTube video and uh, out on the podcast. So thanks so much for participating and hope to see you in an event soon. Yeah, so same here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right.